Outburst, a Todd Mills Mystery, Book 4, author R.D. Zimmerman, publisher Scribble Pub, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 1998, narrator Eric Ost. Chapter 10. After he did it at 5, he did it at 6. And in a few hours at 10, to be precise, he'd do it again on WLAK's 10 at 10. A live intro to the story followed by the package recounting the murder of Mark Forrest. If there wasn't anything new from the police by then, Todd schemed as he drove into town for dinner. He'd try his best to put a fresh spin on it, add a few things of his own, kind of spice it up a bit. Viewers, after all, always had to feel as if they were getting the latest, that there was some payoff for tuning in, and Todd was determined to give it to them. The great stories, the ones every reporter dreamed of, were the ones that grabbed you by the throat, the ones you couldn't get out of your head, the ones that made you hunt obsessively for the truth. Although he'd never voiced it, the things that made Todd realize how thoroughly he loved his job were the kidnappings. The beatings, the murders. The more bizarre, the better. If that body is really him, that Russian stockbroker, then where's the head? The hands? Or how could that young, attractive mother really have done that to her kids? Set the house on fire with him in it. Was it, in fact, the stepfather? Or how could his son have done that to his mother? Trucked her up on pain medication and then buried her alive in the tomato patch? He'd never admit it, but the extremes of the human condition were what Todd feasted on, and this, a strange cop killing, was a hell of a story, no doubt about it. Intuitively, he sensed that there was enough meat here to keep him going for weeks, if not more. That he had been at the murder scene, been not simply a witness, but nearly a victim as well, was spectacular. Virtually no other station in town could even begin to touch it in television's perpetual race to be first. He'd stolen the show. The best that any other reporter could do was stand on the sidelines and report what Todd Mills was doing. Shit, he thought a smile shining through his exhaustion. No way could anyone take this away from him. He was at the top of the pack right now. That much was already clear. For Nan, the producer had watched the broadcast of both WTCN and KNOR. It was regular practice to tape the competition just to keep apprised of the enemy, and both of them had let off not with the cop killing, but the severe weather. The murder came second, each station stating that a suburban cop had been murdered in the city and that the police were pursuing the matter with the help of a first-hand witness. No mention was made, of course, that that witness had in fact been the competition's own Todd Mills. Mm-mm. That just wouldn't happen in today's broadcast world. And they'd reported with great speculation and near glee when Todd had been outed in question for murder. And they'd cover the darkest, most difficult days of his life, but no mention was or ever would be made of this success. He glanced at the dash, saw that it was five after seven. He was a tad late for their dinner reservation, but not terribly so. Rollins, the born and bred Minnesotan, was always either exactly on time or a few minutes early. Janice Gray, a defense attorney whose life was stretched in every direction, either by a court case or a charitable board she volunteered for, was always a few minutes tardy. With any luck, Todd would fall between the two. Entering downtown, he turned left, headed north on Hennepin Avenue, both Minneapolis and St. Paul, he thought. Noticing a group of vacant lots where once had stood several buildings were teetering. Once a region of progressive planning, the cities had taken a huge tumble in the last ten years. The leadership and the public interest both had waned just as things, like the stupid Mega Mall, had selfishly waxed, and they were taking steps toward becoming the Detroit or Los Angeles of the tundra. It drove Todd nuts. As he crossed onto the Hennepin Avenue Bridge and over the Mississippi, he glanced downstream, saw the 3rd Avenue Bridge, and caught a glimpse of the Stone Arch Bridge way down there. Should he do a live broadcast from there? Again tomorrow, or would that be too repetitive? Crossing to the other side, he passed River Place and Nice, that venerable old Polish restaurant and piano bar and 
part. He picked up his cell phone, switched it from ring to vibrate, and slipped it into his front shirt pocket. Go out for dinner. Yeah, sure, Todd. Craig, the late night news producer, had blessed. Do that. Get something to eat. But don't go anywhere without your phone in case I gotta get a hold of you. And be back here by 9.30, not a split second later. Read me? You're on at the top of the 10 o'clock. Cafe Babino was just a half block ahead, and as Todd walked toward it, he realized just how exhausted he was. And no wonder his adrenaline had been stuck on high ever since late this morning when Rollins and he had discovered the body of Mark Forrest. Hopefully a good meal would restore him what used to be a funeral home, and then a cabaret was now a hip restaurant and wine bar, proving that you could bring things back from the dead, and as Todd walked in, several heads turned his way. A gay men, four of them, seated at the bar, scanned him up and down in that queenie kind of way, and then almost in unison returned to their glasses of cabernet. So, what was the once-closeted and now very out Todd Mills, the television personality to them, hero or pariah, or merely a lightning rod of gossip. He still didn't have a handle on it. How he fit, or if he did at all, into the gay community. The host, a short man with short bleached white hair and wearing a white t-shirt and a pale green cotton vest, eagerly rushed up. Addressing Todd before he could even get a word out the host said, Good evening, Mr. Mills. Right. This way, please. The other two in your party are already here. The price of fame or notoriety or both was the lack of anonymity, a dear price that Todd had always been more than willing to pay. He followed the host along the side hall of the cafe, glanced through an archway, and saw both Rollins and Todd's longtime and dear friend, Janice, seated at the corner table, a glass of white wine before each of them. This wasn't good, his being the last to arrive. The dining room was small, with muted yellow walls, dim lights, and a bustling kitchen at the rear. As Todd crossed to his table, several more heads turned his way, but he didn't let on that he noticed them noticing him. Keeping focused, he made a direct line to these two, his pals, and family of choice. The hunky gay cop and the beautiful dyke lawyer, as he called them. They all spoke, all three of them, at least once a day, checking in with the slightest detail of life, who watched what on TV, who was out of cereal, etc., and, of course, discussing ad nauseum just what course of medical action Rollin should take in his battle against HIV and when, even if, should tell Foster, his partner, or Lieutenant Halbert, his superior, or anyone else at the police department about his health status. Janice, whom Todd had dated way back in college at Northwestern University, was tall and thin with short, dark hair and a quick smile. She had pale skin that was very soft, very lovely, and a small mouth that looked for any opportunity to burst into a wide grin. Now dressed in slim blue jeans and a cream-colored cotton knit top, she looked the very image of summer informality. By day, however, there was no doubt about it, she was one hell of a defense attorney. Upon seeing Todd, Janice's smile bloomed, and he realized what a change had come over her in the last year. He saw how much more real her happiness was, for not long ago, she'd solved the greatest mystery of her life, which, in turn, had lifted some kind of awful cloud from her, and actually had bound the two of them together with true familial ties. Yes, she was noticeably brighter, much more at peace, no doubt about it. Hi, he said, bending over and kissing Janice. Hello, doll, she countered, proffering him a generous smack of her lips on his cheek. Rollins sat in the corner, and Todd was going to reach out and squeeze his hand or kiss him with any luck. They had decades and decades left, but who knew? Certainly not the doctors, and Todd didn't care if anyone saw him kissing another man, because the threat hovering over Rollins had taught Todd once and for all what was truly important in life. But Rollins was checking his watch and not moving. Instead, Todd sat down in the seat that always left him in any restaurant, the one that positioned him, so his back was to the main part of the room, the one that left his face the least visible to the public. 
Come on, Rollins, begged Todd, the tone of his voice trying to make light of things. On a scale of one to ten, I'm not that late. What? said Rollins, looking up. Late? No, not too bad. Not tonight. Todd glanced at Janice, who rolled her eyes as she took a sip of her wine. Okay, thought Todd. What's going on? What have I done? A gorgeous young waitress appeared at the side of the table. Her body trim, her skin a midnight black, her hair as short as could be, huge gold hoops dangled from her ears. Would you care for anything to drink, sir? She asked. A glass of wine, perhaps. Todd had it in the jeans, the booze thing, and he was always cautious, always fearful that his father's curse would be his, and he said, You know what? I've got to go back to work, so I'll just have a glass of iced tea. Of course, as the waitress disappeared, and Janice's eyes followed her, and she said, Todd, will you lie to me and tell me I was once that young and beautiful? You were once that young and beautiful, and you still are. But it's not a lie. It's the harsh truth. She took a deep breath and closed her eyes. Hey, I have a question. Gonna dyke me a fag hag? With a grin, Todd said, The politically correct term is that a dyke can be anything she damn well wants to be. He picked up the menu and pretended to look at it. Meanwhile, glancing across the table at Rollins, who was just sitting there, smoldering. Todd didn't dare ask how Rollins felt, which had become a taboo question. I'll, I'll let you know if I feel anything, but great. Rollins always snapped, but he looked at him closely, studied his eyes. His color is good. The eyes clear. Yes, he's fine, concluded Todd. Just pissed. So he wondered as he eyed Rollins, then Janice, what's going on here? I give, confessed Todd. What did I do wrong? Will one of you please tell me? Rollins perused his menu. Nothing. Nothing that we're supposed to talk about, anyway. What the hell does that mean? Making light, Janice shrugged. It means he's a cop. You're a reporter. At first, Todd didn't get it, but then it hit him. And he thought, shit. He should have seen this coming a mile away. Ooh, thank God. We finally got that straight. Rollins kept his nose in the menu, uttered not a single word, and shook his head. Listen, I'm not adverse to plain telephone, began Janice, so I don't mind saying that about two minutes before you came in, Todd, Rollins expressed his, well, uh, frustration with you for... Knock it off, Janice, snapped Rollins. No, I want to enjoy dinner, not suffer through it, so the two of you better get this out of the way. All right, then, Rollins slammed down the menu and leaned across the table. What the hell was that all about? Todd didn't flinch. What could he say? I saw you at five, said Rollins. And at six, too. Rollins, began Todd, his tone more defensive than anything else. I've got a job to do. Besides, I didn't give out any false information. Fuck the media. You shouldn't talk about a killer like that. You're supposed to report the news, not make it. You don't understand. I'm sure that guy's playing with me. I'm sure he's using me. So I... You should have called me. You should have cleared it with us. Rollins, I don't need your fucking permission to say what I want on television, said Todd, bristling. We've been through this. God damn it all. You're a cop. No shit. I'm sorry, but it's something WLAK really wanted to do, and I think it was a smart move. Rollins shook his head, then turned and stared blankly across the room. Playing with a killer is stupid. Whose dumbass idea was this? Todd shrugged and replied, Well, mine. Figures. Janice took a brief sip of wine, and then pushed back her chair. And now that you guys are on a roll, I think I'll go powder my nose, or, or go chop wood, or whatever it is lesbians do when they want to get away from men. Leaning forward as Janice left, Todd kept his voice low and tried to explain. I thought about calling you Rollins. I wanted to, I really did, but it comes down to the ethics thing again. You know, just what the media is supposed to say or is obliged to say to the cops. 
and vice versa. Rollins sh shook his head. Listen, I thought you and I, Todd Mills and Steve Rollins, had a personal agreement. I don't hold out on you and you don't hold out on me. As it is right now, you know virtually everything the police do. Absolutely everything. That's going on in this case. I haven't cut you out of anything, Todd. And, but, you fucked up. No two ways about it. Okay, so maybe he had, and in the back of his mind, he'd known it when he was doing it, too. Just as he'd known it would come to something like this. Right, taking his spoon and twiddling it between his thumb and forefinger, Todd had known Rollins would have a shit fit. The trouble was, Todd had been willing to face the consequences. Absolutely so. I didn't call you, said Todd, putting it all out on the table. Because I didn't want you to say no. Which I would have. Rollins, something's rotten in Denmark. No shit, Sherlock. A guy was killed. Rollins looked right at Todd with those big, deep, disarming eyes. Listen, a couple of things happened this afternoon that you don't know about yet. Like what? First, my partner's mom died. Neil Foster's? Wow, I'm sorry. Well, it wasn't unexpected. She'd been sick for a long time. What that means, though, is that Foster's gone for the next week or so. Rollins shrugged. Consequently, I spent the better part of the afternoon arguing with Lieutenant Holbert. Todd had wondered if it would come to this. An official conflict of interest, and he bent forward and rubbed his eyes. He wanted to pull you from this because of me, right? Exactly. Holbert knew all about them, of course. Hell, it was only last month that he and his wife had had Rollins and Todd over for dinner. So, how, wondered Todd, had Rollins stopped Holbert from assigning this case to someone else? Presuming the case is still yours, what did you have to do? What kind of price did Holbrook make you pay? Asked Todd. Rollins shrugged. I have to sleep at my house. You have to sleep at yours. What? A separation of sorts. After dinner tonight, we're supposed to talk only in a formal setting. Oh, great. This, he knew, wasn't going to be easy or fun except when one of them was working through the night on either a story or a case they'd hardly been apart since they first met. Shit, trying to make light of it with a shrug, Todd said. Well then, we're just going to have to figure out real quick who killed Forrest. No kidding, Rollins took a deep breath. There's one more thing, which is actually the main reason Holbrook is letting me keep the case. As it turns out, he thinks I might have some connections or insights into this that the other guys wouldn't. Which is to say, you were right. Mark Forrest was gay. What? You're kidding! Nope. And that info's for public consumption, too. We got it from the park police late this afternoon. Apparently, Mark Forrest was out as a gay cop and had been since the first day he was hired. Do you realize what that means, Rollins? Said Todd, leaning forward, unable to quash his excitement. It means that there could, in fact, be a gay serial killer out there. After all, that guy who was killed last month was also shot in the chest. It also means I was almost certainly set up. I don't know why, but it's pretty damn clear that I was, and we both know that whoever killed Mark Forrest is going to be watching everything I say. Actually, there's no doubt in my mind that I'm going to get some kind of reaction from the killer. Shit! You're trying to get yourself hurt, aren't you? Rollins put his elbow on the table and bowed his forehead into the palm of his left hand. Todd, don't you see you're being used to get as much media exposure as possible? That's my point. I don't want to give him exactly what he wants. Do you know how pissed off that's going to make him? Yes, but... Todd, what are you trying to do? Turn this into something bigger than it is, or are you going for another Emmy? The anger whooshed through him, but he sat quiet still. Nope, he wouldn't deny it, not at all. Rollins, in case you didn't realize it, I'm always going for another Emmy. Yeah, he replied defeated. I know. At first he didn't know what it was, the quivering against his chest. Todd sat back, touched the shaking thing in the breast pocket of his shirt, and felt a hard plastic case. The phone that was probably Craig, probably calling to bug him about something, 
or to tell him he needed to get his butt back to the station. Of all the times he didn't want to talk to anyone at Channel 10, this was probably right up there at the pinnacle. Perhaps he shouldn't even answer it. What is it? asked Rollins. A call? Ah, oh, Christ. You and that job of yours. Todd hesitated, glanced at Rollins, who was glaring at him, and then decided to answer it. If only to show Rollins who was in charge of what. But how? Todd pulled the phone from his pocket and stared at it, for he still didn't get this. The private phone in a public space deal? Excuse me, said Todd, pushing back his chair. As the small phone vibrated with its silent rings, Todd exited the main part of the restaurant and stepped into the side hallway. He moved up against a window, flipped open the phone, and lifted it to his ear. This is Todd Mills. What's the matter with you? He didn't know the voice, nor could he even tell if it was a man or a woman. For if it was a guy, he had no resonance to his voice. While if it was a woman, she'd been smoking way too long. He asked, Who is this? I mean, what kind of reporter are you anyway? Suddenly, he realized who it might be, and fearing and hoping he was right, Todd's heart tripped, then started pounding. Yes, he realized. The voice indeed was that of a man. The voice, perhaps, purposely hoarse or faint. But was it him? The voice demanded, That was pathetic. I thought you were supposed to be good. That's why I picked you, asshole. Todd saw their waitress coming down the hall from the bar. The desperation all too apparent on his face. He raised his hand and flagged her. When she came over, Todd reached to her tray and grabbed her pen and a handful of cocktail napkins. On one of them, he wrote, It's him, the killer. And then Todd frantically pointed to their table and Rollins. The waitress, understanding only that this was most urgent, hurried off. I'm sorry, said Todd. Who is this? Do I know you? Of course you do, you moron. We met on the bridge over... I guess you could say troubled waters. I see, said Todd, unfolding the napkin and frantically jotting down what was being said. But how'd you get this number? I called the station and told them I was a cop and that we had an emergency. Todd hesitated, glanced over his shoulder, saw Rollins rushing over. But, but how do I know it's really you? Oh, fuck off. Of course it's me. I get crank calls all the time. <sighs> yeah, well, if you fuck up all the time, I'm not surprised. I mean, I know you're a homo, but why did you make that stuff up about me? None of it's true. You know, none of it. Rollins was at Todd's side and Todd jotted on the napkin. Yes, it's him. Tell me something, said Todd, his mind working frantically. Prove it. You're playing with me, aren't you? No, I don't make a fool of me. I don't like it when people do that. And don't say that crap about me either. Rollins ripped the pen from Todd's hand and frantically started writing. Okay, okay, began Todd, reading Rollins' words. So you're the guy who killed Mark Forrest on the bridge? Yes, asshole. Why'd you do it? Because... Because I like killing cops, he replied with a laugh. So you're done this before? Duh! When? A while ago. The voice shifted, got more bossy again. Listen, I just called because I wanted to warn you. Don't do that again. Don't talk about me like that. You don't know me. I'm not an idiot, and I know perfectly well what I'm doing. Who are you? That's for you to figure out, Todd said. But, here. Try to guess this one, you moron. Either brother or sister, I am neither, he laughed. Or I am either, he laughed again. Ta-ta! Desperate not to lose them, Todd blurted out. I think this is a crank call. There was nothing, and then an irritated. What? You've got to prove it. Ah, Jesus. A moment passed, and then the caller said, I fired at you as you dove to the ground and I missed on purpose, asshole. The wispy voice laughed, said one last thing and hung up. Stunned, Todd was silent, then quickly said, Hello? Hello? He shook his head, then pushed the off button and folded up the phone. Crap, he hung up on me. All right, by Todd's side, Rollins looked at the scribbles on the napkins and said, Are you sure it was really him? The guy who killed Forrest? Todd nodded as he jotted down the last of the conversation. It was him, all right. 
not really sure who had snared who, he shrugged and pointed down to his writing. This is pretty much everything he said. Plus, plus what? The last thing he said was that if I didn't stick just to the facts, he was going to make me suffer. Really suffer. Rollins stared at Todd, his brow furrowed with confusion. What's that mean? Hell if I know, said Todd, wanting to shrug it off, but knowing he didn't dare. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.